morning. You're very welcome this morning to our service. I do hope you have a, a happy Boxing Day today. Um, just a couple of notices. Um, this week there's there's really no meetings here until Sunday, um, where we'll meet again on Sunday the 2nd of January at 10 o'clock, and then at 4 p.m. in the afternoon for communion together. Our all-age service will start again in February, so it's not on the first Sunday of January, it'll be the first Sunday of February in the afternoon. Also, there's a calendar available at the back. Some of you may have picked it up already. A calendar for January, just to let you know the goings-on, what's happening, the ins and outs. Not much information on it, but it'll tell you all that you need to know for January. Listen to these words from Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 2 and verse 25. I'm not sure if you've ever made a bucket list or there's something that you really want to do before you die. Simeon here had a bucket list. Well, he, he did, it wasn't really a list, it was one thing and just listen out for it to see if you can hear what Simeon wanted to do, what, what he wanted to see before he died. This is God's word. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. The Lord's, the child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And a sword will pierce your own sword too.
Let's pray together. Let's pray and we'll end together with the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that he is our life, our hope. And we do thank you that, that Simeon wanted to see the Messiah. And we thank you that he did. He saw the Lord Jesus. He saw the hope of Israel. He saw the one who is salvation. And we thank you, God, this morning that we can say that we have seen Christ, that we have experienced him, that we know his salvation. Thank you that we, O oh God, have been rescued from sin and condemnation. Thank you that we are seated with Christ in the heavenlies. Thank you that we have his life within us. And we do praise you, God, that we can gather like this today to, to sing your praises, to worship you, to pray, to hear your word to us. And Father, we do pray that you would draw close to us, draw close to the youngest, right up to the oldest. And we ask that you would speak to our hearts and that you would continue to show us Christ and that you would reassure us of your love for us. And we pray as we meet together around your table later in the service, we pray that that would be a time of, of blessing for us, a time when we would know your presence and know your help. So, Father, please help us to rejoice this morning. Help us to see Christ. Help us to have whole hearts that seek after him. And help us to be satisfied by him alone. And we pray in his name and for his sake. Amen. 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 And I just want to say the Lord's Prayer. My mind isn't working on Boxing Day. Let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Let's pray together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we are able to gather in this way, in this place. Thank you that you have brought us together as your people in this local fellowship. Thank you that you've given us a building that we can meet in and where we can hear your word preached, where we sing, we can sing your praises. And Father, we do thank you for all those who are declaring the good news of the gospel each week, every Sunday by Sunday. We pray for that. The missionaries that we knew um, throughout this world, those we love, those we care for, those we support as a chapel. And we do pray that you would continue to sustain them, that you would help them, strengthen them. For those going through tough times, that they would be aware of your presence, of the assurance of your love towards them. Help them to persevere, help them to keep going. Help them to keep looking to Christ and proclaiming his name. And Father, we thank you for Josh and Rachel here. Thank you for the rest that they can have at this time. And we do pray for them. Thank you that you're with them. Thank you that you're for them. And we do pray that you would continue to lead and guide as they continue in wheels. Father, we pray that in this new form, in this new venture, that you would bless the work, Amen. that you would build your church there, that over the months and years we pray that more and more people would come to know you, come to love you, come to serve you, come to worship you. So please bless them, give them all that they need, and be with them as a family. Father, we do thank you also that your word tells us we can cast all of our anxieties on him because he cares. For us. Father, we pray this morning. There are many of us with burdens upon our hearts, many burdens, issues within our families, worries, concerns. Some are weighed down heavily. Some are simply weary. And we ask that they would cast all of their concerns upon you. That they would run to you and, and lay out their hearts before you. Father, give them grace, give them kindness, give them the peace of God. We continue to remember those who are mourning this morning. We continue to remember the Farleys. Lord, be their strength and their shield. Continue to be with Janet. We pray for her. That you know your closeness, your protection at this time. And for those who even have lost loved ones this year and years past, Lord, Christmas can, can bring up memories. It can be a difficult time and we pray for your help, for your strength, for the comfort of the Spirit. For those struggling with ill health, for those who it is a battle each day maybe just to, to get, get up out of bed in the morning, those suffering from mental illness, for those with physical illness, for those whose emotions are maybe just wired a different way, we, we pray for them, that you would be all that they need, that you would be their strength today. And although they're Maybe mental powers are diminishing and physically getting weaker. We do pray that in their souls, in their inner being, they would be continuing to rejoice. Rejoicing in that love that's in Christ towards them. That love that is long, that love that is deep, that is wide, that is high. Father, may you cause them to, to see you today. Father, we pray that you would hear us today. Thank you that you're not far from us. Hear our prayers. Please guard and direct our footsteps. At the end of this year, help us to continue to be like the, the, the guy in Psalm 1. Not to be seduced by this world, but to, to meditate on your word and to make it our delight. 
Help us to be individuals that bear spiritual fruit. Help us to walk with Christ and to become like him. And help us to know his presence day by day. Father, we bring our lives to you, you, the everlasting God. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please turn in your Bibles to that verse that we read, um, 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. It was the, the, the British ambassador in Washington, and he was rung up by a, a journalist. And the journal, journalist asked him, Mr. Ambassador, what would you like, what would you really like for Christmas? What would you like for Christmas? I don't know how you would answer if you were the ambassador. But he sat on the end of the phone and he thought for a moment, and he sort of thought, well, I, sh- I probably shouldn't ask for too big a thing, maybe not too expensive. So after a pause, he he said, that's very kind of you to phone and ask that. What I really love is crystallized fruit. That would be amazing, crystallized fruits. And he thought nothing of it until Christmas. And he picked up his copy of the New York Times and he read this. One of our journalists has done a survey asking all the different ambassadors around the world what they would really love for Christmas. The French ambassador says he wants peace in our time. The Russian ambassador said he would like an end to world famine and the British ambassador, well, he just wanted crystallized fruits. (laughs) Let me ask you, what would you like for Christmas? What would you really, really want for Christmas? Did you get it? What you really, really wanted? You might think globally, you might think personally, you might be thinking of 2022 and And you're thinking, well, I would love financial security as I move into the new year. And this morning we're going to look at financial security. We're going to look at true wealth. What does it mean to be truly rich? Because the amazing truth in 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9 is that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to earth that each of us should be rich, could be rich, truly wealthy. So this morning I want to look at true wealth and I've got three points, three brief points. I hope they're brief because I didn't think I could do a long sermon this morning. Little ones are up too late at night or up too early in the morning. (laughs) True wealth is relational and not financial. True wealth is relational and not financial. It's the end of another year. It can be a good time to re-examine our values. And for most, I think, in our society, in our world, our values are materialistic. They're consumerist. I read a a bumper sticker that said, it simply said, and I think this sums up our society, he who who dies with the most toys wins. I think that sums us up. The winner, the most successful person, is the one who manages to accumulate the largest bank balance, to have the most possible possessions, to have all the toys. And yet the sad reality is that it is possible to have huge sums of money and to live in a lovely home, to have all the toys and yet be unsatisfied. Henry Ford, he was the the founder of the Ford Motor Company and he once said this, I was happier doing a mechanic's job. Someone commentated this. They said, money can buy you a house, but not a home. Entertainment, but not happiness. A suit, but not a physique. A bed, but not sleep. Companionship, but not love. And Jesus says, it's relationships that matter above everything else. It's not money, it's relationships. The Bible says that there's one God, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in eternity, before the world was created, that God had existed. 
And there was perfect, pure love in the Godhead. And then God created the world and he created us human beings. And he created us in his image to love and to be loved. He has made us to be relational. He has made us to be in relationships with one another. And if we don't enjoy relationships with others, we will be the saddest of all people. That's why at Christmas time, life can be daunting for some. That's why relationships can be heartbreaking. But if we knew solid, deep relationships with family, with friends, with church, you will have a contentment that the richest person, the loneliest person, the richest, loneliest person in the world could only dream of. We were made for relationship. And above all, made for relationship with God himself. Our loving creator. He made us to relate to him. And starved of that relationship. We know that there's something missing. It's been said that there's a God shaped hole. In our lives. And we do try to fill it with other things. We try to stuff things into that hole. To be satisfied. Whether it's material stuff. Whether it's friendships. Whatever it is. But nothing quite fits. And that's why Jesus Christ came down from heaven to earth. He came to fill the gap. That we might know God as our Father. That we might know Christ as our friend, as our Lord, as our Saviour. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. True wealth is relational. It's relationship with others, but above all, it's relationship with God himself. And then true wealth is eternal. It's not temporal, it's eternal. In other words, true wealth lasts forever. It lasts forever. I read that Christmas shoppers have the same heart rate and the same blood pressure as riot police. Mm -hmm. And you can sort of imagine that, or although everything's done online and you can sort of just click and blood pressure is quite low unless you're trying to do it on Christmas Eve. But it is war out right there. As you hit the sales, it's a bit like Black Friday. People sort of are attacking each other. They get their hands on things. But despite all that effort, and despite all the money, the sad reality is that Christmas presents, they, they, they don't last. They're soon forgotten. I saw, I, re I read a poll I shared this with, with our Thursday at Chapel people. And it says one in four people can't remember a single present they received last year. I think I could be the one in four. There's a sobering one for the women, for the wives. One in two men, one in two husbands could not remember what present their wives gave them last Christmas. John's nodding his head. <laughs> so if you want a tense boxing day, <laughs> Just ask him, you know, what did I buy you last year? Also, one of three presents end up on eBay. And I'll probably be on eBay trying to click to buy it. They don't last, do they? And even if we appreciate the gift, and even if we want to keep hold of the gift, usually I'll end up broken, or I'll end up just fading into the background at some point. And it's not, not just presence. The high street is a rem reminder of the, how frail our, our economy is. I was listening to the radio and they brought up Woolworths. Do you remember Woolworths? And, and the guy sort of described it as Amazon on steroids. You know, Woolworths, you'd go in, you'd buy whatever you wanted. You sort of had to hunt for it and dig for it, but it was a great shop. But it's not there anymore, like many shops. Or if you look at the, the world economy, it's fragile. It doesn't last. It's up and down and more down than up. And even if we do manage to hold on to our possessions, and even if we do manage to hold on to some prosperity, the Bible reminds us that the day will come when we will die and we can't take anything with us. 
There was one vicar. He was taking a funeral of a wealthy lady and someone asked him, well, how much did she leave, vicar? And he said, she left everything they always do. And what would you say about someone who invested all their worldly wealth in a company that they knew was heading for liquidation? What would you say to them? I think you'd say, like, how foolish. Why did you do it? And Jesus says, we are foolish if we invest our time and our ambitions in things of this world that won't last. Jesus, in one of his most famous sermons, gave this investment advice. He said in Matthew 6, Do not lay up for yourself treasure on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. Don't do it. And he's not saying don't earn your living. He's not saying food and clothes are irrelevant. We need them. We enjoy them. We need them to survive in this world. But what he is saying is, do not live for those things. Do not place your security in the things of this world. They will not last. He continues, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. Jesus is saying, if we are wise, if we're truly wise, we will live for something that will last for eternity. The Bible says we will all die. We will meet God, our Creator. He will come as judge. And someone writes, I don't think on that day God will ask how many bedrooms in your house. I'm not sure he will say, I'd, I'd be fascinated to know what car you drove. Things that are so important to us will be so irrelevant on that day. And he continues, the question will be, did you love him? Did you know him? How did you serve him? Did you live for the eternal good of others? Jesus says, do not live for the things of this world that do not last. Jesus left all the glory of heaven and he came down to earth that we might have the most precious thing this world affords, friendship with God, friendship with Christ, a friendship that lasts. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. True wealth is eternal and not temporal. Thirdly, true wealth is charitable and not earnable. It's charitable and not earnable. I used to have a habit of going into bookshops. I don't do it that often, but I used to go in the, the book section that I went to was an interesting section. It was all it was sort of the financial section. I had this habit of going in and, and reading books on finance. Didn't understand them, but it was interesting. And I, I remember having a, always having a little browse through the books. And all of these financial books had the same basic assumption. If you were wise and if you tried hard enough, and if you made the right decisions, and if you did the right things in life, that you could be wealthy. It really, it, it's up to me. If you want to be wealthy, make the right decisions, make the right choices, invest in the right things, it's up to you. And a lot of people, I thought, transfer that thinking into the realm of their spiritual lives, into the realm of, of spiritual wealth. So they assume, if I try hard enough, then I can be on the right side when it comes to God. It's sort of our, our default setting, isn't it? We, we, we settle on it. It's our performance to be right with God, to be friends with God. But the Bible says that cannot be. It takes someone to be charitable towards us, for us to be right with God, to be friends with God. And that's why Jesus had to come down from heaven 
to earth. I remember staying in a village. Um, we, we were very young, young kids, my sister and I. And, and just across the road, there were, there, were, there were some girls who were really quite badly behaved. I think they made us look like angels, which was quite startling. And the parents of these girls got so fed up, they said, if you don't behave, if you don't sort it out, when it comes to Christmas Day, you're going to get sticks instead of presents in your stockings. That's the way it's going to be. So we, we sort of laughed and thought that's a bit old fashioned, what are they talking about? But the parents carried out their threat. The girls didn't up their behaviour, even at Christmas time, even with threats. They continued to squabble, they continued to fight, they wrecked around, they caused havoc. And on Christmas Day, they were all excited and they got up and they opened their stockings. And there's basically sticks in the stockings. A bit harsh. But we can't assume. We can go up to God and say, God, please give me presence. Please give me the gift of life and salvation and friendship with you. Because of the marvellous way that I've lived my life before you. Because if we think like that, we're just like the girls. Because of our sin, we constantly fall short of God's standard. We deserve much less than sticks. We deserve his displeasure. We deserve his judgment. We deserve to be separated for him, from him forever. And yet amazingly, he offers the gift. Totally free. Friendship with him. We're more like the child who said yesterday, or his, his mother posted on Facebook, I can't believe Santa left me all these presents because I ain't even been good. And we're a bit more like that. We can't approach God demanding our wages. We can't approach God thinking, I should be right with you. Look how I've lived. Look at my performance. I deserve it. If they approach him as beggars, asking for charity, asking for help, crying out for, for salvation. I was, I'm, I'm told over four million in Britain are struggling to pay off their credit card bills from a year ago. British consumers have something like 50 billion pounds worth of credit card debt. And the sad reality is that debts will rise and rise harder and harder to pay off but that's where we stand before God we're a massive debt before him and we have no hope of paying it off and yet the good news and especially at Christmas time is that that's why Jesus came Jesus Christ became poor to pay it off for us. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> that though he was rich. Yet for your sakes he became poor. That you through his poverty might become rich. Rich not in the world's eyes. In a richness that doesn't last. But rich in the eyes of the one who really matters. God himself. So let me ask you this morning, what do you want? If you could ask for anything, what would you ask for? Are your concerns, are our concerns focused more on the things that are around us? Things maybe to achieve, but things that don't last? Or do you really want to be truly wealthy? To be right with God. To call him Father, Friend, Lord, Saviour. That gift has been offered to us. The price has been paid. And when the Lord Jesus died on the cross, he paid our debts. And the question that I am bound to ask this morning is, have you received that gift? Have you received it? Do you love that gift? gift is it precious to you 
For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. We'll pray, and then we'll sing together, and then Mass will lead us at the Lord's table. Father, we thank you. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that although he was rich, he became poor. So that we could become spiritually rich in your sight. And Father, we thank you that as you look at us this morning, we are the most privileged people on this planet. We are spiritually rich. We have all the, the spiritual blessings in Christ. Thank you that we have been adopted into your family. Thank you that we're children of God. Thank you that we are clothed in that perfect righteousness of Christ. Thank you that we are yours this morning. And we do thank you for the fellowship, the friendship, the families that we have. Thank you for that love that we do experience. We thank you most of all that you love us. And because of that, we can say it as well in our hearts and in our souls. So, Father, please help us to appreciate more and more how much you love us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
and say you cannot have Christmas without Easter. You cannot have Christmas without Easter. With Jesus, we are not allowed to pick and choose, and that's what we've been hearing about this morning, isn't it, as Simon has preached. You cannot have Christmas without Easter. You cannot have Jesus just as a baby, just in the manger. But you must have all of him. He doesn't let us pick and choose. Um, I don't know whether you uh, picked up that, that phrase that's so often missed when in the reading that Simon opened with. Um, there's, a, there's that moment in the temple court. Simeon meets the, the baby Jesus. He meets Joseph. He meets Mary. And he starts off with this great proclamation that salvation has come to the whole world. And if we, if we were making a film of it, it would be a nice wide-angle shot. You'd capture as many people in the shot as you could. But then there's this, other, there's this second thing that he says. And I think if you were to film it, you'd zoom right in. It would be a close-up on Mary. Because Simeon turns to Mary and he says... This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And then he says this, this phrase that we could kind of lose or miss, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. You cannot have Christmas without Easter. You cannot think of the nativity scene with Mary holding the baby without seeing Mary at the foot of the cross 33 years later. The two cannot be separated. There was a, a Christian named Augustine. He lived in North Africa. And in one of his Christmas sermons, he, he used this poem. The word of the Father, by whom all time was created, was made flesh and was born in time for us. He, without whose divine permission, no day completes its course, wished to have one day set aside for his human birth. The maker of man became man, that he, the ruler of the stars, might be nourished at his mother's breast, that he, the bread, might hunger, that he, the fountain, might thirst, that he, the light, might sleep, that he, the way, might be wearied by the journey, that he, the truth, might be accused by false witnesses, that he, the judge of the living and the dead, might be brought to trial by a mortal judge, that he, justice, might be condemned by the unjust, that he, discipline, might be scourged with whips, that he, the foundation, might be suspended upon a cross, that courage might be weakened, that he, the healer, would be wounded, that life might die. You cannot have Christmas without Easter. It's, and it's Christ's birth that we celebrate, not just Christmas, but that actually we spend the time remembering Easter, remembering what Christ accomplished on our behalf. You know, it strikes me that we're not told when Jesus was born. It certainly wasn't the end of December. We're not told even to really celebrate Christmas. What are we told to do? What did Jesus tell us to do? Well, he actually left very few instructions, but one that he gave, he put, it was passed on from Christian to Christian from the beginning. And it reached the Apostle Paul. He, he, he writes, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, We'll read that together in just a moment, the rest of it. What did Jesus say that we had to remember? He said, it wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't that Christmas isn't important, but there is no Christmas without Easter. Let's, let's pray as we come to the emblems of the table that the Lord would help us to search our hearts and he would help us to centre our hearts on him in this act of worship and remembrance. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for what we have been reminded of this morning. That your Son came into this world as a human child. That he humbled himself. 
that he became poor, the one who owned, who owned the universe and beyond, that he became poor that we might be rich. And Lord God, we thank you that we are recipients of that grace, of that love, of that mercy. And we come this morning as your people to remember that once again. We gather together and we take this meal that the Lord Jesus set up. And so Lord God, as we come to the table now, we do what we were instructed to do and we examine ourselves for a moment in our own hearts. We examine ourselves for that unrepented sin, for whatever it is that is between us and yourself, that we might take this meal in a way that is fitting, in a way that brings glory to Christ. Now, Father, we do thank you for what these emblems represent. For Christ's body given for us, given, given for us individually, but given for us as his people. Lord God, it was a communal meal. It was one bread shed. We thank you for his body given, his bread. That he was the bread of life. He is our bread of life, and he will continue to be our bread of life. We are sustained by our relationship with him. And so we break this bread in remembrance of him. is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after, the, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. When you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Our Father God, we do thank you for what the wine represents. We thank you for the Lord Jesus' blood poured out for us. For that sacrifice on the cross. And we thank you that when we consider this blood it is, it is the solution that washes away our sin. And it is also the mark of the new covenant. That steadfast promise that you have given to your people that we will know salvation that we will know you, that we will be redeemed, that we have a glorious future, a blessed and living hope. You have promised all this, and you have marked that promise by the shedding of your son's blood. But Lord, we can't take that in, not fully, but we do ask that as we just Again, participate in this act of remembrance, that you would refresh our memories, that you would, again, cause us to consider this. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's proclaim the Lord's death once again. Cease to see.
Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. <laughs> 